Section 1. Listen to a talk to new students at a university. Then answer questions 1 to 3. Hi, it's good to see you all here today. And what a pity the weather is so bad for your first day at university. <laughs> it could at least have stayed sunny today. Now, my name is Pat Baker. I work for Student Services and I'm going to tell you all about our mentoring scheme for new students. We've had it in place for a few years now and people starting at university for the first time in general find it a very positive experience at these meetings. What happens is this. Each of you, if you want to that is, will be assigned a mentor. That is someone who's been studying here for a year or two and who can show you the ropes. In other words, show you how things work give you advice if you need it, and just generally be a friendly contact for you in the university. Of course, you'll have your tutors and lecturers who will also help you with academic problems, but this is someone more your own age who has been through the same experience quite recently. What the mentor does is have a group of usually two or three students, and he or she organises meetings, preferably about once every two weeks. We generally find that more than that's just too often, where you chat about your problems, university life, or just about things in general, and your mentor will give you the benefit of his or her experience. If you're joining this scheme, you'll be meeting your mentor today, just after lunch. If you haven't signed up, by the way, it's not too late. Come and see me after the talk. Don't be frightened about this first meeting. It's going to be quite sure, so you won't have time to tell your mentor all your difficulties. You'll just get to know each other a little bit and, most importantly, fix a time and a place for your next meeting, which you can have when you're feeling more relaxed and not so overwhelmed by the newness of it all. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen to the second part of the talk and answer questions 4 to 10. Mentors, as I've said, have been through the same experience as you quite recently, so they can understand your problems. They'll be able to tell you about academic systems, which are so different at university from what you were used to at school. Also, because at university you are much more independent and you have to spend so much time studying on your own, they can suggest techniques for studying which will help you to keep up to date with your work. This university is an enormous place, so another thing which they'll be able to help with is university facilities. You know, anything from sports halls to libraries to medical services and they can probably help you get involved in all sorts of social activities too. Parties, clubs, sports, whatever. So, as you can see, this is a pretty useful scheme, but it does rely on people keeping in touch. The telephone's pretty useful if you have one, but students are busy people and often out doing things, so email is probably better. Your mentor will be able to show you how to get an email account, they don't cost anything to students. They're free. For people who have never been away from home before, a mentor is a useful contact and support. Somewhere between a friend and a parent. And no doubt as the year progresses and you start getting nervous around exam time, your mentor will be ready with useful tips on the best way to pass your exams. After all, they did the same ones either last year or the year before and they passed them. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
section 2 on page 32. Section 2 You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about old racing cars. First, look at questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. The Goodwood Museum is currently celebrating some of the most extravagant types of car design in its Festival of Speed. Here's our reporter, Vincent Fried, who's on site to tell us about some of the cars on display. Well, here I am, standing in front of one of the most prestigious cars ever built, the Duesenberg. A fantastically expensive, luxurious car built in the early part of the 20th century and bearing all the glamorous qualities of the Jazz Age. How many were there? Well, only 473 Duesenberg J-types were ever built, and the model here is one of the rarest. Each had a short 125-inch chassis or framework, and the body was always in the form of an open two-seater. The technology behind the car's 6.9-litre engine was extraordinary. It featured capsules of mercury in the engines to absorb vibration and provide an incredibly smooth ride. In fact, these cars offered unparalleled performance. In an age when 160 kilometres per hour was considered very fast, the Duesenberg promised a top speed of 180 kilometres per hour and could do 140 kilometers per hour in second gear. Duesenberg, who designed the car, sold it as a frame and engine. This was typical of the age again, and many prestige manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce did exactly the same. Owners able to afford the hefty $9,000 price tag for the basic car would then commission a coachwork company to build a body tailored to their own individual requirements. The Duesenberg's great attraction for the driver was its instrument panel, which offered all the usual features, but also several others, including a stopwatch. It was the Duesenberg's technology that lay behind its success as a racing car, and they dominated the American racing scene in the 1920s, winning the Indianapolis Grand Prix in 1924, 25 and 27. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. On to another celebrity, the 1922 Leia Helica. Only 30 of these French propeller cars were built, and the model here at Goodwood, which was the fourth to be made, is thought to be the only surviving example still capable of running. The brains behind this car was Marcel Leia, who was an aviation pioneer first and foremost, and the influence of flying is quite apparent in the car. The Leia very strongly resembles a light aircraft with its front propeller, but in this case, it's minus any wings, of course. It's quite odd to think that this car was whirring through France just as the Duesenberg was blasting down roads at 160 kilometers per hour across the Atlantic. The Leias were used regularly in France in the 1920s, and were even produced in saloon and van form, as well as two-seater. The Leia matched its propeller drive with its equally bizarre steering, which used the rear rather than the front wheels. But despite looking rather frail, it was a tough machine. 
In fact, when troops tried to steal it during the Second World War, the car's baffling design was clearly beyond the would-be thieves, and it ended up being driven into a tree, breaking the propeller. And now for the Firebird. This extraordinary car was first... That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear three university students talking about a presentation which one of them has to give. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Joe. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Paul. Oh, hi, Paul. I've heard you've been stressing out about your presentation on art. I am. Are you still going to talk about the different types of art? Yes. Well, I was planning to, but there's so much stuff on the subject that I'm finding it difficult to put it all into one short presentation. Huh. I usually have the opposite problem. There's nothing worse than going blank, forgetting your words in front of a group of people. Well, the problem is that I don't know how to organize what I want to say in the presentation. Well, you know everything there is to know about the subject. It's just a question of selecting what you want to talk about. Well, there's a lot to discuss about the different periods in art. That's a good way to start. Then you can bring in how specific types of art were popular in each period. Yes, like how sculpture was popular in the classical period and paintings were popular in the Renaissance period. And how now a wide variety of media are used to create modern art. As long as you keep it concise because it's a large area, there are so many periods and movements in art, and you don't want to just list them one by one. I agree. An explanation of the movements and periods in art wouldn't be too long. You're right. I need to just pick out some key points, just mention the periods quickly so that I can move on to the real topic of the presentation. Yes, the variety of art, like sculpture, paintings, installations. I have an idea. Why don't you prepare a timeline to show to the class? That would be a nice visual, and it would focus your ideas so you don't get too sidetracked. Great idea. It would certainly cut down on time. Right then. Where are we? You'll begin with a very short introduction to the historical periods of art. Then, you'll talk about popular types of art within these periods. That's sorted. Maybe... You could also mention some key works of art in each period, like the Venus de Milo statue or the screen by Edvard Munch, and give some interesting facts on them. That's not a bad idea, because it does give people a frame of reference when I talk about specific kinds of art. After giving a historical context, I should really talk about different forms of art, shouldn't I? Yes, you should. After that, you can conclude with a question on what is considered to be art. Now, that would be really interesting. Yes, comparing the traditional views of art with modern views. Exactly. I think I'll have a collection of pictures, including famous pieces of art from classic to modern, projected on the wall, like the Mona Lisa and some pop art, and ask people whether they think it's art or not. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, 
You have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Showing some famous works and asking people what art is would certainly lead to discussion in the room. People's appreciation of art is so subjective, and it comes down to taste. That's what I'm hoping for, some disagreement to liven up the presentation. And you could stick in some really controversial ones like graffiti and modern art installations in between pieces of art that are universally accepted, like the work of the Renaissance painters. Sounds good to me. I have to say I really don't understand some modern art myself. There was one recently that was just a pile of rubbish. It doesn't require much skill to create, does it? And what does it mean? There's no point to it. Actually, Joe, I like some modern art. It makes you look at the world in a different way. Artists now have the freedom to express themselves completely. Yes, but there is an idea now that anything can be art. I've heard of paintings being sold for large sums of money, which have been done by small children and animals. Now that's ridiculous. Oh, you could find one of those paintings and put it in your presentation, couldn't you, Paul? That would really be interesting. Well, Paul, what do you think? I like it. Just thinking. I'll need to do some more research to find pictures for the slideshow. Yes, we can help you, can't we, Joe? Of course. If you go to the fine art section of the library, I'm sure you'll find everything you need. Just ask the staff and they'll give you access to a slide bank of hundreds of famous works of art. And if you still can't find what you're looking for, Use the library computers to go online. There are lots of images on the internet. Of course, you'll need to use a search engine like Google, but it's dead easy. Thanks, guys. I'm feeling much clearer about the project. Your ideas have been really useful. I think I should end with a quote of some kind by a famous artist. What do you think? That's a good idea. Now let's go to the library and see what they have. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a student giving a presentation about a project on household waste recycling. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, my group has been doing a project on how household waste is recycled in Britain. We were quite shocked to discover that only 9% of people here in the UK make an effort to recycle their household waste. This is a lower figure than in most other European countries, and needs to increase dramatically in the next few years if the government is going to meet its recycling targets. 
The agreed targets for the UK mean that by 2008 we must reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 12.5% compared with 1990. And recycling can help to achieve that goal in two main ways. The production of recycled glass and paper uses much less energy than producing them from virgin materials. And also, recycling reduces greenhouse gas emissions from landfill sites and incineration plants. As part of our project, we carried out a survey of people in the street. And the thing that came up over and over again is that people don't think it's easy enough to recycle their waste. One problem is that there aren't enough drop-off sites, that is, the places where the public are supposed to take their waste. We also discovered that waste that's collected from householders is taken to places called bring banks for sorting and bailing into loads. One problem here is taking out everything that shouldn't have been placed in the recycling containers. People put all sorts of things into bottle banks, like plastic bags and even broken umbrellas, all this has to be removed by hand. Another difficulty is that toughened glass used for cooking doesn't fully melt at the temperature required for other glass, and so that also has to be picked out by hand. Glass is easy to recycle because it can be reused over and over again without becoming weaker. Two million tons of glass is thrown away each year. That is, seven billion bottles and jars— but only 500,000 tons of that is collected and recycled. Oddly enough, half the glass that's collected is green, and a lot of that is imported, so more green glass is recycled than the UK needs. As a result, new uses are being developed for recycled glass, particularly green glass. For example, in fiberglass manufacture and water filtration. A company called CLF Aggregates makes a product for roads, and 30% of the material is crushed glass. For recycling paper, Britain comes second in Europe with 40%, behind Germany's amazing 70%. When recycling started, there were quality problems, so it was difficult to use recycled paper in office printers, but these problems have now been solved. And Martins, based in South London, produces a range of office stationery which is 100% recycled, costs the same as normal paper, and is of equally high quality. But this high quality comes at a cost in terms of the waste produced during the process. Over a third of the waste paper that comes in can't be used in the recycled paper, leaving the question of what to do with it. One firm, PaperSave, currently sells this to farmers as a soil conditioner, though this practice will soon be banned because of transport costs and the smell, and the company is looking into the possibility of alternative uses. Plastic causes problems, because there are so many different types of plastic in use today, and each one has to be dealt with differently. Packright recycles all sorts of things, from bottles to car bumpers, and one of its most successful activities is recycling plastic bottles to make containers which are used all over the country to collect waste. The Save a Cup scheme was set up by the vending and plastics industries to recycle as many as possible of the three and a half billion polystyrene cups used each year. At the moment, 500 million polycups are collected, processed, and sold on to other businesses such as Waterford, which turns the cups into pencils, and Johnson & Jones, a Welch-based firm, which has developed a wide variety of items, including business cards. Well, to sum up, there seems to be plenty of research going on into how to reuse materials. But the biggest problem is getting people to think about recycling instead of throwing things away. At least doing the research made us much more careful. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.